Hey there, Celestial Piper with Soldier of the Watch. So I just wanted to remind you to smash that like button. Also hit that subscribe and then that little bell so that way you will know of new videos. I hope you enjoy this. Stay tuned. There are matters which might benefit from your attention. Friends cannot be neglected. From aliens and demons and fallen angels and celestial beings to stargates and portals concern. That's what we're going to be talking about today. And at our next video, I'm going to have a special guest on sharing their experience. CERN, Large Hydron Collider. Could this be the key to the abyss spoken of in scripture? According to Wikipedia, CERN is an official United Nations observer. Established in 1954, the organization is based in a northwest suburb of Geneva on the Franco-Swiss border, and it has 22 member states. Israel is the only non-European country, and it granted full membership. CERN is the home of the Large Hydron Particle Accelerator. You may be asking, what does this have to do with being a key to the abyss? Well, let me explain first what this particle accelerator does, and then we can discuss why this could be used as the key to the abyss. The Hydron Collider, or LHC, is one of the largest machines on Earth. This particle accelerator will cause the beams to collide with each other and then record the resulting events caused by the collision. Scientists hope that these events will tell us more about how the universe began and what it's made of. From a believer in Christ's point of view, we may look at the scientists and say to ourselves, why did they build this huge machine to collide particles, putting all on Earth in danger? I'll explain shortly. When the answer to what they are looking for is simple, God. What all of us believers in Christ have to understand is that they are scientists, and most scientists are believers of the Big Bang Theory, and they are out to prove that theory is the correct answer for life as we know it, even though the answer is right in front of their face. Since many scientists have not truly been able to prove that the Big Bang Theory is a fact, they have tried many experiments to prove the theory and to find that glue that holds everything in the universe together. Now we know that Yahweh, Jehovah Rapha, which means God, the great I am, is the glue that holds everything together. Ironically, the glue they are searching for is called the God Article, AKA Higgs Boson. How could this potentially put the lives on earth in danger? This theory, AKA standard model, tries to define and explain the fundamental particles that make the universe what it is. It combines elements from Einstein's theory of relativity with quantum theory. It also deals with the three of the four basic forces of the universe, strong nuclear force, weak nuclear force, and electromagnetic force. It does not address the effects of gravity. And the fourth fundamental force. Did the last couple sentences catch your eye? Nuclear force? What? This doesn't sound good to me, especially after Stephen Hawkins was quoted saying that the God particle, which gives shape and size to everything that exists, could cause a catastrophic vacuum delay if scientists were to put it under extreme stress. Um, uh, really? Should they play God with this stuff? Some scientists and biblical scholars have expressed their concern 
that's putting it lightly that this could cause, if not what Stephen Hawkins stated, but also time shifts and possibly opening a portal to usher malevolent entities into our world. Yes, you heard that right. Malevolent entities. And let me just mention Mandela Effect. Scientists had discovered antimatter when running the collider. Employees at CERN have reported seeing faces inside the collider. Hmm, interesting, right? Per Wikipedia, in modern physics, antimatter is defined as a material composed of the antiparticle, or partners, to the corresponding particles of ordinary matter. You did catch that, right? Anti-particle. We have the god particle, and now the anti-particle? Interesting, to say the least. Now, if we have antimatter, then we must have matter. We as living beings are considered to be matter. If we are matter, what would be antimatter? Well, I don't know about you, but I don't think I would want to find out if I were those scientists. Yet here they are, messing with the things that they have no business messing with. It has been said that the LHC could possibly open portals, cause disturbances in the weather. Oh, how about that one? And at worst case scenario, create a black hole. Yeah, just, you know, at the worst. That's all. Nothing serious. Just a conspiracy theory. Or is it? If it truly is a conspiracy theory, why would Stephen Hawkins state that the God Particle could cause a catastrophic vacuum delay? Like a black hole? I doubt it was a joke. I'm not laughing here. I feel this needs to be taken very seriously. So right now, I am speaking directly to my brothers and sisters in Christ. The LHC could very well be the key to the abyss spoken of in Revelation 9. If I'm wrong, then great. I would love to be wrong in this case. So in Revelation 9, it says, The fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. And when he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss. And now the smoke, locusts, came down on the earth and were given power like that of the scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were not allowed to kill them, but only to torture them for five months. And the agony they suffered was like that of the sting of a scorpion when it strikes. During those days, people will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. The locusts looked like horses prepared for battle, and on their heads they wore something like crowns of gold, and their faces resembled human faces. Their hair was like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the thundering of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. They had tails with stingers like scorpions, and in their tails they had power to torment people for five months. They had, as king over them, the angel of the abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek is Apollyon. Guess what that means? Destroyer. The first woe is past. Two other woes are yet to come. The sixth angel sounded his trumpet, 
and I heard a voice coming from the four horns of the golden altar, that is, before God. And it said to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates, and the four angels who had been kept ready for this hour, very hour, and day, and month, and year, were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of the mounted troops was twice, 10,000 times 10,000, and I heard their number. The horses and riders I saw in my vision looked like this. Their breastplates were fiery red, dark blue, and yellow as sulfur. The heads of the horses resembled the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and sulfur. A third of mankind was killed by the three plagues of fire, smoke, and sulfur that came out of their mouths. The power of the horses was in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails were like snakes, having heads with which they inflict injury. Pretty darn scary, if I should say so myself. Now I'm sure you're wondering, what about the LHC made me think about this scripture? Outside of CERN is a monument of Shiva, the Hindu god, also known as the destroyer. As you can see in pictures above, So, okay, you see where I'm going with this, correct? Why would scientists who are supposed to be out to prove the Big Bang Theory or the glue that holds the universe together have a monument of the Hindu god Shiva, aka the destroyer outside their building? Even more important, we should ask why they are having mock rituals and sacrifices both in and outside of the building. It's just unbelievable.
I don't know about you, but seeing a bunch of scientists have some kind of ritual thing at CERN really doesn't sit well with me. How about you? I mean, obviously, there's something to it. And I know that they say that they do these mock things all the time. So I honestly believe that first video I showed you really is a mock uh, sacrifice. I don't think somebody got killed. But still, what the heck? But they're saying, oh, yeah, we're just trying to find the glue that holds the universe together. Well, why are you doing that? It makes absolutely no sense. And what's up with this, like, stuff that's obviously biblical when you're watching the video? But it's the other side. It's the other side. The, the anti-Christ people. That are saying, and in your face, you did not defeat Satan. I mean, that's how I take it. With Katy Perry. That song, E.T. Come on now. Well, the next thing we're going to be talking about is the t 10 different species of extraterrestrials, or as us Christians believe, interdimensional beings. Our first extraterrestrial or, or interdimensional being is the Nordic aliens. According to Wikipedia, in ufology, Nordic aliens are humanoid extraterrestrials purported to come from the Pallades who resemble Nordic Scandinavians. Professed contactees describe them as typically male, six to seven feet tall, about two meters, with long blonde hair and in blue eyes and skin tones ranging from fair to tan. UFOlogist George Adamski is credited with being among the first to claim contact with Nordic aliens in the mid-1950s. And scholars note that mythology of extraterrestrial visitation from beings with features described as Aryan, and we have heard that before, Hitler was trying to create an Aryan race. Often included claims of telepathy, benevolence, and physical beauty. Our next one is the Pleiadians. And there are several different spellings to that. Now, according to ufo.wikia.com, the Pleiadians are presented as both multidimensional spirit beings and humanoid beings who identify with the Pleiades star cluster in the Taurus constellation and possibly Era. It is likely that they are modified by or related descendants of the Anunnaki as they share similar characteristics and both identify with Taurus. Pleiadian ships are referred to as beam ships by channelers. So under agenda on this website for Pleiadians, it says the Pleiadians have visited Earth as early as 10,000 BCE alongside the Anunnaki. Pleiadians in humanoid form are said to practice sex cultivation. What? The distinct difference between sexual expression and sensual emotion. They likely seated the Nordics or are the Nordics in humanoid form? They have been in conflict with the Greys and other species over the alien abduction phenomenon. The Pleiadians are associated with the Ashtar Galactic Command, and by extension, the Galactic Federation of Light on a mission to spread enlightenment or a higher spiritual state to other species, namely humans. So under Cabal, 
on this website says during the 1980s and early 1990s, accounts of Palladians given by people other than Billy Meyer began to diverge from earlier New Age concepts. And Billy Meyer, according to this website, is a self-style contactee. He is a Swiss national who claim they visit him several times since the 1940s. Um, he says that these, or this species, originates from the planet Era, which is E-R-R-A. So I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. And that's supposed to be an alternate dimension. So back to what I was saying under the Cabal. In these alternate accounts, the Palladians were said to be one side in a cloak and dagger confrontation over the fate of humanity. Such accounts worked in a number of pre-existing urban myths and conspiracy theories, including the New World Order and reptilian conspiracies, as well as variations on the Illuminati and CIA mind control conspiracies. These references were not found in Billy Meyer's original accounts. In some cases, such as claims made by self-professed medium Barbara Marsniak, accounts of contact with Palladians were also intermixed with Millennium. So our next species is Andromedans. And according to aliens.wikia.com, they are allegedly real sapient extraterrestrial beings inhabiting the constellation Andromeda. This species are said to have visited Florida during 1954. I guess ET's vacation as well. Let's just go get some sun over in Florida. Anyway, under biology, Andromedan are either humanoid or energy beings. Since beings or things cannot be made of energy, akin to how they cannot be made of mass, the latter description is implausible. However, by energy, being certain witnesses might actually be referring to plasma beings instead. Most sources and pictures depict them as blue or violet. Similar beings have been depicted in ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. According to some sources, the Adrobinans form part of an interstellar federation known as the Council of Andromeda. Their goals for planet Earth and humanity vary from removing all hostile extraterrestrial presence to promoting the use of electric cars. However, they always seem to have good intentions and are protective of humankind. Although due to certain findings, their presence on Earth can be traced as far back to the days when the ancient Hindu deities and the ancient Egyptian hierarchy ruled, which leaves a lot of uncertainty about their true goals for humanity. So our next species is called the Arcturians. And I am referencing it from abp.wikia.com. The Arcturians are a humanoid, mammal-like extraterrestrial species native to the planet Arcturus. They were the first sentient alien species encountered by mankind and humanity has since established interspecies trade with them. The characteristics of Octorians are roughly humanoid, bipedal in form, and comparable to size to humans. However, they are comparatively lacking in mental capacity. Their intelligence has been linked to that of lower apes. Biologically, they exhibit an unusual combination of insect and mammalian traits. Physiologically, they mammal-like, yet they live in subterranean colonies that reproduce via a single fertile egg-laying queen. Like humans, they are warm-blooded, omnivorous, and breathe oxygen, yet they are eyeless, 
and communicate and rationalize their surroundings through a form of natural sonar. The species reproductive cycle is particularly curious. After hatching from their egg, their young are amphibious and are raised in warm pools in a communal nursery at the bottom of the hive. Despite their curious biology, Arcturians are sexually compatible, at least in a recreational sense, with humans. Although not typically aggressive, colony members are fiercely defensive for their queen, or of their queen. So our next species is called Zeta reticulans. Her extraterrestrials dot wiki wikia.com the zeta reticulans are described as very similar to the average depiction of a gray alien they are described as being slightly more human-like than an average gray however they have eyes described as all black with no pupils or iris they have large heads with no hair at all and have small and hard to see ear-like bumps on the sides of their heads they have, in addition to their more human-like appearance than typical greys, small seemingly human noses, as well as human chin and facial expressions. Zeta reticulans are described as wearing silver jumpsuit-like clothing that covers their entire bodies, including half of the neck, upper torso, and legs, while the uniform does not cover the head or the hands. In a book titled Alien Abduction, however, images of several Zeta reticulans wearing light blue clothing with silver trimming were depicted. There is not much known of these particular aliens. The only evidence of the Zeta reticulans coming from the star system Zeta reticuli is Betty Hill, who claims that while she was being examined by one of the aliens during her abduction, she asked the alien what planet it and the others that were on board the UFO were from. Betty claims that the alien showed her a star map of the Zeta Reticuli star system, which was not discovered until after the Hill's alleged abduction. Betty revealed this information of her and her now deceased husband's abduction while under hypnosis and drew a picture of the star map of Zeta reticuli so our next species is little green men yes you heard me right little green men so little green men according to wikipedia is the stereotypical portrayal of extraterrestrials as little humanoid like creatures with green skin and sometimes with antenna on their heads the term is also sometimes used to describe gremlins mythical creatures known for causing problems in airplanes or on airplanes and mechanical devices. Today, these creatures are more commonly associated with an alleged alien species called greys, whose skin color is described as not green, but gray. During the reports of flying saucers in the 1950s, the term little green men came into popular usage in reference to aliens. In one classic case, the Kelly Hopkinsville sighting in 1955, two rural Kentucky men described a supposed encounter with metallic, silver, somewhat humanoid looking aliens, no more than four feet in height. Employing journalistic license and deviating from the witnesses' accounts, many newspaper articles used them or used the term little green men and writing up the story. The usage of the extraterrestrial definition clearly predates the 1955 incident. For example, in England, reference to the little green men or children dates back to the 12th century, green children of wool pit. Though exactly when the term was first applied to extraterrestrial aliens has been difficult to pin down. Folklore, Researcher Chris Aubeck has used electronic searches of old newspapers and found a number of instances dating from around the turn of the 20th century referring to green aliens. 
Albach found one story from 1899 in the Atlanta Constitution about a little green-skinned alien in a tale called Green Boy from Hera. Hera being another planet, perhaps Mars. Edgar Rice Burroughs referred to the green men of Mars and green Martian women in his first 1912 science fiction novel, A Princess of Mars. Though at 10 to 12 feet tall, they were hardly little. However, the first use of the specific phrase, little green man, in reference to extraterrestrials that Albeck found dates to 1908. I'm sorry, 1908. <laughs> in the Daily Kennebec Journal, Augusta, Maine. In this case, the aliens again being Martians. In 1910 or 1915, a little green man was allegedly captured from his crashed spaceship in Apulia in southeast Italy. Green aliens soon came to commonly portray extraterrestrials and adorned the covers of many of the 1920s to the 1950s science fiction pulp magazines with pictures of Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon battling green alien monsters. The first documented print example specifically linking little green men to extraterrestrial spaceships is in the newspaper column satirizing uh, the public panic following Orson Welles' famous War of the Worlds Halloween broadcast of October 31st, 1938. The column by reporter Bill Barnard in the Corpus Christi Times the next day begins, 13 little green men, 13, oh, wow. That's kind of a favorite Illuminati number, if I'm correct, from Mercury stepped out of their spaceship at Cliff Moss Field, local airport late yesterday afternoon for a goodwill visit to Corpor Corpus, sorry, Corpus Christi and ends with, then the 13 little green men got in their spaceship and flew away. The familiarity with which the term was used suggests that this probably was not the first instance where it was applied to extraterrestrials and spaceships. I'm not going to keep going on. Um, there's a lot of information on the little green men, and you can check this out on wikipedia.org. According to this site above, Syrian aliens. In Sirius live more alien species, humanoids and non-humanoids, most benevolent. He writes here, just a few races from Sirius. The Syrians are, in general, benevolent aliens, fourth, six dimensions. Many Syrians are deeply wise, conscious, spiritual, and loving, empathic people. In Sirius, there are many hybrid races, or also races, created by a race who's called by some master race. Note the master race created Pleiadians too. Orion Syrians, you are already seeing their physical description in the picture. I don't know how many fingers they have on their hands and toes. This person in this uh, blog called them Orion Syrians because they are descendants of a race from Orion in present. And at that time it was 2016. The Syrians say they were mining for minerals such as gold on their own planet. That sounds like the Anunnaki. Their goal was to build explosive weapons, but what these explosive weapons would have been used for or against whom the Syrians did not say. Then someone else, a species that was either a separate group of Syrian themselves or another alien species, took over those mines and enslaved the Syrians to work for them. Their Pleiadian brothers were willing and ready to help the Syrians by evacuating them from Sirius in a peaceful solution to the problem. But the Syrians chose the violent route to fight for what was theirs. Pleiadians did not provide the Syrians with any weapons, and for this reason, the Syrians feel that the Pleiadians were not being helpful at all. The evading forces brought in more troops and rained down explosive meteorite bombs that fell on the Syrian planet, forming the many craters that now cover the planet's surface. 
the Syrians had sent one part of the Syrians into safety in the mines underground, and the other half of the Syrians had remained on the surface of the planet to fight. The Syrians now lost the second part of the battle, and the invaders took away all of the Syrian women. The remaining Syrians had no choice but to flee, and they are now refugees. These aliens from Sirius are benevolent, friendly, and loving, and they are descendants of Lyran aliens. They are very tall and slender beings, standing between 7 to 7.5 foot tall. They had a soft tan colored fur over and their whole bodies, and their manes are their hair, and they flow around their lion faces and hang well down over their narrow shoulders. They have cat-like eyes, noses, and mouths, and like lion or cat-like ears. Their eye color ranges from blue to gold and can change from blue to gold as they mature. They also turn from a golden brown color to white. I don't know how their hands, fingers, and legs look. Probably they may have cat-like fingers, hands, and toes. Their fingers may be a little long than those of felines. Somewhere close. Blue Syrians. The Syrians also played an important part in the histories of Lemuria and Tihunaka, Mura, Egypt, and Sumeria. The blue Syrians are benevolent, spiritual, and loving. Their skin is bluish. They can have it. I'm sorry, they can have hair or they can have no hair, blonde hair or other colors too, and they have Egyptian eyes, five fingers on hands, and four toes. Their ears may be very little or inexistent. Human Syrians, they look exactly like humans. Blonde or brown hair, blue eyes, high forehead, five fingers and five toes, Caucasian skin color, etc. There are other races in Syria. Alien reptilians. So I'm on this site, alienuforesearch.com, as you see above. And this explains these guys like this. The reptilians are reptoids, alien race, which is a word mixed from reptilians and humanoids and are the same creature are human-looking lizard creatures that can shapeshift. They are also known as dinosauroids, lizard folk, lizard men, saurians, alpha draconians, and sauroids. Reptilians are tall, around 7 to 9 feet, have green scaly skin, three long fingers, and a poseable thumb with talons on the ends, holes for ears, muscular legs and arms, and large eyes. There have been reports of reptilians with and without tails, with and without wings, and hidden genitalia. They have been sighted wearing very little clothes except for armor, but are always seen with some sort of utility belt said to be used to help them become invisible. Reptilians are a very dangerous alien species, according to this site. They are bent on domination of the Earth. They are very intelligent, known as evil, have telekinetic powers, and have a warlike mentality that has driven them to secretly incorporate themselves into our society for their cause. Some conspiracy theories suspect that many important leaders are actually reptilians acting as humans in order to help them with their agenda. For example, George W. Bush to members of the British royal family. There are a few different theories as to where the reptilians actually come from. Some say that they were here on Earth before us humans and live in secret underground in various caverns around the world, while others believe that they are from the Alpha Traconi star system of the Orion constellation or both. Now, the reptilians have been around since the beginning of mankind and have been thought to have given the human race much of its early technology, helped build the pyramids, worked with the Mayans, and helped start early religions pretending to be gods and manipulating Adam and Eve in the Bible. While dealing with the story of the Garden of Eden, the Midrash also deals 
with the serpent. It declares that before causing Adam and Eve to sin, it had legs. According to this, the serpent was once a tall, splendid, and regal creature. When its fate was decided, and it was written that, Upon thy belly shalt thou go, the ministering angels descended and cut off its arms and legs. This tradition gives the image of the enticing serpent an impressive dimension that has repercussions on many viewpoints of the ancient world, which was, I'm sorry, which saw the serpent as representing forces of evil on one hand and possessing supernatural powers on the other hand. Unfortunately, their final goal is to eventually enslave the human race in the New World Order and use humans for mining and other physical tasks when the time is right. Out of all the different types of aliens visiting Earth, the reptilians are by far the most dangerous to our very existence as humans. They have very little respect for us and want the Earth for themselves. Some say that the Greys have been working against the reptilians in order to help the human race, but it is unclear why. They may have similar agenda and just don't want the reptilians to acquire the earth before them. Yeah, because I'm sorry, the greys look scary looking too. <laughs> the Anunnaki. Those of royal blood are believed to be mortal gods that inhabited the earth during the ancient Sumerian time in Mesopotamia. Sumerian civilization developed on the Persian Gulf, growing to a strength at around 4 to 3000 BC. The plain of the land of Shinar is the territory which, after 2000 BC, became called Babylon. The Greeks named the region Mesopotamia, the land between two rivers, most of which lies in the modern state of Iraq. The first recorded civilization of mankind, and they were advanced with currency, astronomy, and farming. So the history of the Anunnaki. The exact origins of the Sumerians are unknown. The original homeland of the Sumerians is also unknown. It is believed that they came from the east, but whether by sea or from the highlands is unknown. We know that they are not local people because their language belongs to an isolated language group. During the 5th millennium BC, a people known as the Eubadians established settlements in the region later known as Sumer, Mesopotamia. It has been noticed that there are very clear similarities between the Ubaid artwork and that of Old Europe. Vinca culture, which flourished circa 6,000 to 3,500 BC. At around 3,250 BC, another people migrated from its homeland located probably northeast of Mesopotamia and began to intermarry with the native population. The newcomers, who became known as Sumerians, spoke an agglutinative language unrelated apparently to any other known language. By 3100 BC, the population of Sumer had increased to the point where people were living in cities. The first Sumerian ruler of historical record, Etana, king of Kish, flourished about 2800 BC. It was described in a document written centuries later as the man who stabilized all the lands. The early dynastic period of Sumer covers the part of the third millennium from 2800 to 2400 BC and ends with the conquest of Sumer by a Semitic king of the north, Sargon of Akkad. After the kingship descended from heaven, the kingship was in Eridug. In Eridug, Elulam, hopefully I'm saying these are right, don't judge, became king. He ruled for 28,800 years. That's just downright crazy. The Sumerians are amongst the first people to leave sophisticated records of their astronomical observations. Fascination with the heaven is apparent in the large number of seals and cuneiform tablets unearthed of an astronomical nature. 
Sumerians were the first to divide both space and time by units of six. The modern division of the year into 12 months, the 24 hours of each day, the division of hours into 60 minutes and 60 seconds, and the divisions of the circle sphere by 360 degrees, each composed of 60 minutes and 60 seconds of an arc are all Sumerian developments. This same division by units of six has been observed at several of the prominent British megaliths. The Sumerians were also aware of the importance of Pleiades showing, in, showing it in several seals and images. In addition to being thought of as the seven great gods gathered together, the morning setting of Pleiades was used to mark the beginning and the end of the agriculture year. This cylinder, seal, and then in parentheses, it's got VA uh, forward slash 243, State Museum, East Berlin, shows a star with several, which are 11 planets surrounding it. However, as there are no known records of the Sumerians having knowledge of any more than five planets in our solar system, the jury's out over what it represents. And then it shows right here in a little print, these beings were not from this world and had a special bloodline. The Nephilim offspring from the Anunnaki and human beings were on the earth in those days. Genesis 6, 4 says the Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children by them, they were the heroes of old men of renown. Zachariah Stitchin, which we talked in our last video, believes that the Anunnaki genetically engineered modern day humans by crossbreeding with Homo erectus. They did this to use humans as a slave race in order to mine gold from the earth. According to Stitchin's interpretation of Sumerian cosmology, there is a hypothetical planet which follows a long elliptical orbit reaching the inner solar system roughly every 3,600 years. This planet is called Nibiru, which we discussed as well. The planet associated with Marduk and Babylonian cosmology. Nibiru collided catastrophically with Tiamat, another hypothetical planet that was between Mars and Jupiter. The collision formed the planet Earth, the asteroid belt, and the comets. Tiamat, as outlined in the Enuma Elish, is a goddess, according to Sitchin. However, Tiamat may have been what we know now as Earth. When struck by one of planet Nibiru's moons, Tiamat split in two. On a second pass, Nibiru itself struck the broken fragments, and one half of Tiamat became the asteroid belt. The second half struck again by one of Nibiru's moons, was pushed into a new orbit, and became today's planet Earth. This scenario is scientifically disputed. However, Sitchin's supporters maintain it would explain Earth's peculiar early geography due to cleaving from the celestial collision. Solid continents on one side and a giant ocean on the other, and would also explain why the Earth is layered in sediments. According to Sitchin, Nibiru was the home of a technologically advanced human-like extraterrestrial race called the Anunnaki in Sumerian myth who were called the Nephilim in the Bible. He claims they first arrived on Earth probably 450,000 years ago looking for minerals, especially gold, which they found and mined in Africa. These gods of the Anunnaki were the rank and file workers of the colonial expedition to Earth from the planet Nibiru. Are humans a genetically engineered slave race? Sitchin believes that the Anunnaki genetically engineered Homo sapiens as slave creatures to work their gold mines by crossing extraterrestrial genes with those of the Homo erectus. Sitchin claims ancient inscriptions report that human civilization in Sumer of Mesopotamia was set up under the guidance of these gods and human kingship was inaugurated to serve as an intermediary between the Anunnaki and mankind. Sitchin believes that fallout 
from nuclear weapons used during a war between factions of the extraterrestrials is the evil wind. What destroyed Ur around 2000 BC, Sitchin himself claims the exact year is 2024 BC, as recorded in the Lament for Ur. Sitchin claims that his research coincides with many biblical texts and that biblical texts come originally from the Sumerian writings of their history. Okay, so that was one point of view. So what do you think the point of view will be for the Christians and other religions? Next time, we're going to have a special guest on. And we're going to get to listen to his experience with what he believes is extraterrestrials, as we talked about today. And then I'm going to do another video, and it's going to show the other side view and then we'll have another guest on who can share his experience so i'm really excited about this series i would love to hear from you guys um, any comments any questions i am on twitter now and so if you could follow me on there that would be awesome i also set up a facebook account under celestial piper so that would be pretty awesome if you um would request me as your friend and then of course I want to remind you again to go ahead and hit the like button click on subscribe the bell so you'll be notified of new videos and don't forget I have an email and you can reach me at soldier of the watch at gmail.com until we meet again guys be blessed I love you all